there are certain supplements that may be helpful at preventing the spread of infection. The one that has been tested in a controlled study was quercetin. And I would say in general, a diet that is high in bio, bioflavonoids and other polyphenols is really important for two, for three reasons. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Life podcast. Today, we have a very special guest. He is a graduate of Harvard University and New York University School of Medicine, and his name is Dr. Galland. Dr. Gallen is a board certified in internal medicine, and he's listed in the leading physicians of the world and America's top doctors. In 2017, he was awarded the Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Achievement Award, and he's on the medical advisory board of the Global Lyme Alliance. Uh, Dr. Gallen received the Linus Pauling Award from the Institution of Functional Medicine for developing basic principles of functional medicine, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, he's also a pioneer in studying the impact of intestinal microbes, the gut microbiome, and intestinal permeability, leaky gut, on health and disease. And he has received international recognition for developing innovative, innovative nutritional therapies to treat autoimmune, inflama uh, inflammatory, allergic, infectious, and gas gastrointestinal disorders. Uh, and he uh, has his described his work in numerous scientific articles and textbook chapters. He's also authored many books. So it's just an absolute pleasure to have you here today, Dr. Gallen. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me to speak to Laura. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure our community is going to be very excited and we're going to learn a lot here today. So let's just start with uh, a little bit of a background of, uh, you know, you have a long, a long history, a long list of accolades. Um, maybe let's do a kind of a brief background of, of how you kind of got to what, where you are today and, and what you're most interested in today. Well, I came the route, I came to follow the route that I followed, mostly because I'm kind of a perfectionist. And I realized that the treatments and the diagnostic approaches that I'd been trained with, and this was some time ago, back in the um, 1970s, mostly, really weren't adequate to help patients that I was seeing. I mean, they work pretty well in an acute inpatient hospital setting where they're, you know, critical care, um, but they really didn't help people out in the community. And um, in particular, I was very dissatisfied with the effect of drugs. If you use a drug to treat a problem, you then create another problem. Mm. And um, I became interested in nutrition. Uh, I left academic medicine after a few years of teaching because I felt that there were important truths about health and, il and illness that in my lifetime would not make it through the doors of most academic institutions. And so I wanted to go out and, and find out what they were for myself. And I realized that, that the big problem in medicine had to do with the perspective that the intellectual basis for modern medicine which is the theory of diseases. It believes people get sick because they contract a disease. And so even though, you know, you hear in medical school, oh, treat the patient, not the disease. It's all about making a diagnosis of the disease and treating the disease. And you're given no tools for treating patients. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that there is a whole missing curriculum that doctors need in order to be able to treat patients. And that includes nutrition, environmental health, behavioral medicine. Um, those, those are really the pillars of it. And, but understanding detoxification. Um, and uh, I began re-educating myself. Uh, basically, um, this was in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And I was amazed to discover that there was a huge body of scientific information available about these areas, but none of it had been carried over to the practice of clinical medicine. So I began trying to do that. 
And of course, one of the first things I realized is if you can treat a problem with nutrition rather than drugs, not only don't you create the side effect, but you can treat more problems. You can treat several problems at once because you're really getting to the closer to the root of problems. You know, so if somebody, for example, has pain or arthritis and you put them on a drug to treat the arthritis, well, you might cause stomach ulcers and kidney problems. But if somebody has arthritis and stomach problems and kidney problems, you can treat them all nutritionally. Mm. I mean, that was the that was the revelation that I made. And and over the years, I looked deeper and broader into the nutritional underpinnings of health and illness. And I would discover things that were important to me in my practice that made a difference to my patients. So I would then go out and teach them and um, to small groups of physicians who were interested in going the same direction. And what was really gratifying is I would get feedback from these physicians saying, hey, you know what you said about omega-3 fats? That really works. So I knew that it wasn't just, okay, I believe in this and I'm convincing my patients to believe in this, that this, uh, you know, and there is a science behind it, but that this was something that you could, that I could teach other physicians, they could apply it in their practices and it would make a difference. Now, along the way, I became very aware of the importance of the gut when it comes to nutritional therapies, and not just as the root of entry for nutrition. Of course, your gut has to be able to accept the dietary changes and the supplements, but that there's a lot going on in the GI tract that really impacts inflammation, neurologic function, um, basic healthy patterns in the body. And so going back, it's over 30 years now, I started to focus what I was doing on what later became called the gut microbiome. That term didn't exist at that time. And, um, and, and so I started looking at phenomenon like leaky gut dysbiosis, which is an overgrowth of undesirable species. Um, and the interactions between the gut and the brain and the gut and the, and the immune system and the gut and hormones. And then trying to apply that in clinical practice, writing about it, lecturing about it. And um, it's been actually quite an amazing journey of discovery um, and exploration and finding things that do make a difference for people. And at the same time that I was doing this, the people were changing. And there was this growing interest in these therapeutic approaches, not just in relying on drugs. And so that's also been very gratifying to know that there's an interest and I'm finding things that are, that not only work, but that people are interested in, um, which kind of led me up to the pandemic. Yeah. And with the onset of the pandemic, I remember January of 2020, I was, um, you know, I realized I, patients of mine are going to be very worried about this. This is going to leave China. I had no idea at that point how massive it was going to be. But I thought, I really have to understand this new disease, COVID-19 and um, what, the, what its physiology is, what's, go, what's causing it, what, what is happening in the body when people are exposed to this. And I, I had taken a deep dive back during one of the flu epidemics into flu and natural approaches to preventing flu, which had been very useful um, with the H1N1 flu. So I thought, okay, well, let me see what I can find out about SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. It was kind of overwhelming as this information came in. Um, I remember in February of 2020, I felt like I had um, pre-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> I mean, you know, the anticipation. I mean, I was having a hard time sleeping at night. There was so much information to absorb and there was so much that was happening um, uh, 
you know, on a daily basis in the world. But by, by March, I felt as if I had a pretty good handle on the pathophysiology of this virus and steps that could be taken to help people who were exposed or getting sick. Um, and I began making those recommendations to patients. Um, and it's always hard to evaluate, you know, when you've got something new like this, how well does this really work? Um, but the feedback that I got from patients was very encouraging to me. That, yeah, I, I think I understand. And my approach has, for years, has been try to understand the biology and the physiology of, of, of ailments um, and how to apply that understanding to individual patients rather than let's identify the disease, let's suppress the disease. Um, and as we began to move into the phase where long COVID was a real phenomenon uh, and it was, it was clear in the spring of 2020 that there were people who were not bouncing back and recovering fast, even those who hadn't gotten that sick. And certainly by the, by 2021, it, it was clear that there is a phenomenon. Part of that phenomenon involves changes in the gut microbiome, but there's way more than that. It's a very complex set of changes that occur in the body after COVID-19. And so by the beginning of 2022, I had developed um, uh, a graphic to try and describe it. I first started talking about long COVID in the spring and summer of 2021. I had a, a presentation that I put together kind of to help people understand it. Because, you know, the, I would say one of the biggest problems with long COVID is the fear Mm. that is generated. And that has been true throughout the pandemic. I mean, there is so much emotional trauma associated with this. And the, the idea of long COVID is uh, there's this horrible life altering disease and nobody understands anything about it. And, and that's not really true. Yes, it can be life altering and horrible, but we, there, there have been billions of dollars spent on research on this. Now, almost none of it has come back with useful treatments, but we know a lot about the biology and the pathophysiology of long COVID. And if you're willing to step outside the disease model and the need for drugs, you can use, and, and you have the, the right background, you can use what we know about biology and physiology to come up with useful ways to help people. And especially if you, if you have an approach that is basically oriented towards the patient rather than, than the disease. So the diagnosis doesn't matter. It's what is happening in this person. Uh, and so I put together this um, graphic that I call the web of long COVID. It's on my website, drgallum.com. I've talked about it in various presentations, most of them professional, but not all. And it looks at all of the interacting biological factors that occur, the changes that occur in the body when you get COVID-19 and how each of these interacts with the other strand of the, another strand of the web and how these strands then lead to the symptoms and the ailments that occur after COVID-19. Um, it has st stood the test of time. That is, I first developed it in January of 2022. It's still valid. And every new piece of research that comes out, I, I find a place for that in the web. That is, it's not as if, and, and also knowing where this fits in, it's way less overwhelming because, oh yeah, so this bizarre study came out of, um, you know, someplace in Europe or Asia or Australia or Canada or maybe the United States or, or South America. But it, this, it looks like, oh, 
what does this tell us? This is all new information. But actually, you can find if you can find a place for it in the web, then you understand how it fits in with everything that we have learned. And um, there is a very coherent picture of what this virus does to us. The challenge is finding ways to undo the dysfunction and the damage that's occurred. Yeah. And sometimes you need to use drugs, but the basis for it is really nutrition, environment, lifestyle, um, psychology, mindset. Um, and as I said, this um, panic and fear about it, that yeah. nobody knows anything about it. And, and it's, that is terrible. And yeah, I've had I'm so gonna, many. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was going to say, you know, when it first came out and listen, obviously when it first came out, nobody knew a lot of people were scared, but then you had the news really perpetuating it, right? Like with the, you know, COVID tracker on the, on all the news stations and really perpetuating this, this fear that scared so many people. And a lot, I haven't heard anyone else really talk about this. I study a lot. I've studied a lot of psychology and, and belief systems. And, and, you know, there's a fascinating new study that came out that shows just your belief about what a drug is going to do to you can impact what it does. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So Let me tell you about that. There was a study done mm -hmm. on people with heart disease mm -hmm. it was placebo controlled trial. And, but what they did was they looked at the people who took the placebos versus the people who didn't take the placebos. And the people who actually took the placebos, who were in the placebo arm, they had a great outcome because they <laughs> believed in the placebo. Right. And the people who didn't take the placebos, they had a pretty poor outcome. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you're, you're, uh, I would say that, that we were really done a disservice yeah. by the, atmosphere of fear that was created. Yes, caution is important, but um, but but that atmosphere of fear is not good. Yeah, I, I've wondered a lot. I've actually thought about this quite a bit. I wondered if there if there was no news and it reminded me of something like Napoleon Hill, you know, back when it was the Great Depression, went to the president and they had a big, you know, boardroom with, with all the and there was only a few different news outlets at that time and they were like we need to change the narrative here. People are scared. Nobody's invest. No one's doing anything. And they kind of got together and the news outlets agreed. You know, now there's way too many news outlets to get everyone to agree and to do something like this. But we're going to change the narrative. And then, of course, you know, kind of things turned around. Uh, and so I think I always wonder, you know, if people weren't so scared, if there wasn't so much fear being perpetuated, you know, if you think, hey, there's this virus out there that's going to kill me, and then you get it, you're going to be much more likely to have a bad outcome compared to if someone like you were teaching everyone, hey, listen, here are, here's what's going on here. Here's how, here's some natural things you can do. I think a lot of people would have a much better outcome. Uh, yeah, that was, so that's where I started, you know, in March of 2020, because I realized the information the information that people are getting from the government is just, is not going to help them. Right. And the whole attitude was, well, let's lock everything down um, until vaccines are ready. And I mean, that was such an inadequate response. And um, there is, um, there is abundant evidence that there are, natural factors that can impact the course of this. And one of the best studies, uh, then of course this was done, you know, two years into the pandemic, um, but it was a pretty good proof of concept. It was a study that was done in six countries and it was led by researchers, really top level researchers at Johns Hopkins um, and Columbia and Harvard um, they looked at the impact of pre-COVID diet on the outcome of COVID. They were, most of the people they studied were actually male doctors, probably, but it was a kind of homogeneous group. They were healthcare workers, and it just wound up that they mostly got male doctors in there. So they divided people into two groups, uh, people who had survived COVID. One had had minimal or mild disease, and the other had had moderate or severe disease. 
and they questioned them about their diets using standardized validated questionnaires, the dietary protocols they had been following for the year before they got COVID. And the results were very striking. The worst outcomes, and this came as a little bit of a surprise, but the worst outcomes were in people who had been on low-carb, high-protein diets. Really? Interesting. They were four times as likely as people following vegetarian, quote, vegetarian diets Mm -hmm. to have moderate or severe disease. Now, the vegetarian diet was not a vegan diet. There was, there were egg, you could have eggs, you could have, um, there was fish, it was more of a pescatarian, pesca-vegetarian diet, but eat, there was even dairy in it. It's just that the people following this, um, quote, vegetarian diet had more vegetables than the people following other diets. And the people on high-protein, low-carb diets did worse than the people who were just on eating a regular American diet. Wow. And um, yeah, and the people, but the people who did the best were following a pesca vegetarian diet. And in fact, a 40% increase in the number of vegetables eaten, which did not amount to a lot. I mean, it meant going from two vegetables a day to, to less than three vegetables a day. I mean, that's, you know, it may be, maybe compared to the standard American diet, that's a lot. But I'm sure compared to most of your, most of your listeners are already there. Um, there, um, there was a 70% decrease in the likelihood of developing moderate to severe disease compared to mild to minimal disease, minimal to mild disease. Now, just imagine if a drug came out and it said, oh, this decreases the likelihood of COVID being severe by 70%. I mean, the kind of headlines that would make. Right. You know, so. Yeah. Um, I, I think that just says, uh, that just says a lot. It was, I mean, it was a really good study. Now, having said that, I have seen people who developed long COVID who were very healthy, were following amazingly good diets, were physically fit, um, young people, and then COVID came along and it really slammed them. Mm-hmm. And maybe they didn't get that sick with COVID, but the post-COVID problems were severe. Now, that doesn't happen very often, but in the people who are consulting me, it happens quite a bit because, you know, I see a very, I don't see a cross-section of like people. I, I see a very select group of people who are th- who are thinking the way that I do about illness and who are seeking out help that they have a hard time getting. Right, right. Yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack there. I'd love to. I'm sure our listeners are are on the edge of their seats, wondering, okay, so you know, what what do I what do I? I mean, I mean we know that I think it was like 79 percent of the hospitalizations were people that were overweight or obese or something something like that, right? So we know obviously not being overweight and and or, or obese is is obviously a huge a huge aspect of it. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit. I definitely want to get into what is the best kind of diet, nutrition, lifestyle advice that people should follow now to ensure, you know, if an, you know another strain comes through, they don't, you know, they don't, if they get it, they don't get it that bad. But what, what do you think are, what are some of the mechanisms you had mentioned earlier? There's some mechanisms of COVID that really affect certain people, you know, versus others. Like, for example, someone who's overweight, why would they get COVID worse than someone who's not? Okay, the, the way that COVID makes people sick, it, I mean, it's, it's, there are multiple ways in which it happens, but it enters your cells, most of your cells, through an enzyme called ACE2. Now, and when it does that, it damages ACE2. ACE2 is part of your body's response to inflammation. That is, it it is a corrective response. It is, so if you are constantly under some kind of biological or physiologic stress, you're going to have a lot of ACE2. Mm. So they'll have more opportunity for the virus to get into your cells, but you also need more ACE2. And once the virus gets in, it damages it. So the net result 
is a deficit of ACE2 compared to your needs. And the loss of ACE2 plays a major role in the outcome of the infection and in what happens with long COVID. Um, and ACE2 is especially important for the health of blood vessels. And I think the most important single characteristic of COVID-19 is it impacts your blood vessels. Mm. We thought of it, oh, this is a respiratory virus like the flu. Well, it may enter through your nose, but where it really causes the most damage is the blood vessels. There's inflammation of the lining of blood vessels, which leads to micro, microscopic blood clots. And that I see in almost everyone who gets sick. Mm -hmm. So trying to reverse that process, I think is very important. Um, and at this point, it would be great if there were a foolproof way to prevent getting COVID if you're exposed. Um, I certainly have worked on approaches to that. And sometimes they seem to work very well, but then a new variant comes along and they don't work as well. Early, very early in the pandemic, this is like in the summer, late spring, early summer of 2023, as I was trying to figure out how can this be prevented? It does enter through the nose. Is there a nasal spray that would prevent it? And I actually designed three. Hmm. Um, one was easy to implement because it was based on heparin, which is approved as an anticoagulant drug. Hmm. And I later discovered that there were researchers at the University of Mississippi and in Australia who were working on the same approach, spraying heparin into the nose, act, which acts as a decoy. The, the virus sticks to the heparin and doesn't stick to the cells of your nose. The first year and a half of the pandemic the heparin spray worked great. Hmm. Um, hardly anybody, you, almost no one using it properly got COVID. There were a few, couple, few people who did, but they weren't using it when they should um, have been. And, uh, but once Omicron came along, it was so much more infective, infectious that it just, you know, it was able to blow through that. Um, I'm not, none of the vaccines prevent infection. They do help, for the most part, they help you get less sick if you're in a high-risk category. I think the evidence is pretty solid there. Um, but um, I think we can anticipate that almost everybody is going to wind up getting COVID at some point, and maybe more than, probably more than once, I mean, maybe repeatedly. One of the things that makes us virus really different from the flu is it's not seasonal. I mean, it is seasonal, but it's worse in winter. But, you know, there are, people are getting this in the summer, in the middle of summer. Um, it is much, it's so much more readily transmitted. It is airborne in a way that the flu isn't. It loves air conditioning. Hmm. So because cool, dry air is what, I mean, that's, it really likes to um, float around on cool, dry air. Mm -hmm. And there may still be nasal sprays that can work to prevent infection. And there are several that I've worked with and one that I'm um, helps, trying to help the, in the development of. Um, there's pretty decent data that the right nasal sprays can prevent infection. Uh, with are, COVID. are there any but uh, right now that, that you would recommend people, yeah, people buy? Yeah, well, there are a couple that I'm having people use, uh, my patients use. Yeah. Um, the heparin is only available by prescription, and it has to be a special pharmacy, and there are very few of those, so that's not uh, readily available. There is one based on carrageenan. Carrageenan comes from seaweed, hmm. and um, it has actually been shown to have antiviral activity, it coats the lining of the nose. There's the only one that's available in the US in the carrageenan category is a, is a product called Norazite. It's made by a company in the UK and it's very non-irritating, which is very nice. And, and it's something you can I, use all, all year round? Like no- Yeah, you can use no it at any time. Yeah. Yeah, I've even found a couple of patients who 
who found that their allergies were better when they used it because it's kind of lining, it's, it's coating the lining of the nose. And it's not prescription, um, not prescription, non prescription effects. No, nah, I mean, look, anybody might feel a little irritated uh -huh. by something they put in their nose, but this is very mild. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually has been demonstrated to decrease transmission of COVID and to help with other viruses as well. So I have, I recommend to my patients that in high exposure situations, you know, you're going to be at a meeting, you're going to be at a concert, a wedding, um, you're flying, you're traveling on public transportation. Uh, and this is what I use myself. They use this a couple of sprays in each nostril every four hours. There's another nasal spray, which is available in the U.S. I mean, it's a circuitous route. You have to get it through an Israeli pharmacy. It was developed in Canada. I mean, you know, the, the, the global networks of things you have to follow are, are kind of crazy, but um, it, um, it's called Enovid, E-N-O-V-I-D. In Canada, it's called Sanotize, S-A-N-O-T-I-Z-E. This kills, this is antiviral. It kills the virus by generating nitric oxide. Now, this feels a little bit like spraying chlorine into your nose. Mm. It's not as dangerous as chlorine, but it might be irritating. So I might have, probably the main thing I'm doing is having people use the Norazite during the day if they're exposed, and then when they go to bed at night, use the end of it to, to try and kill any virus that might still be hanging around and maybe using it first right. thing in the morning. Very um, interesting. And so that's one approach. Now I've seen failures with that approach. Yeah. You know, someone at a wedding who spends six hours eating with someone else who has COVID, you know, and doesn't know. But, 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 but I do think that that nasal sprays can work. And eventually, when there's a nasal vaccine available, I think that will be that will that is really going to make the difference. Because okay. this is where that virus gets into your body. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Um, so, and, and developing an immunity that is focused on the nose, on the secretory immune system, I, I think that'll make the difference. And there'll be so way fewer side effects. Interesting. Very interesting. I'd like to transition now a little bit, because I think a lot of people might be wondering, uh, I'm wondering myself, okay, so like, what do I do? What's the nutrition plan I need to start following? Again, we're coming up on, you know, the, you know, quote unquote flu season, you know, maybe the, you know, maybe another strain of the virus is going to come back, you know, as it usually does in the winter time. What can we do to protect ourselves? Um, number one, and then if we do get COVID, uh, are there any recommendations there? So you mentioned the pescatarian diet, you know, is, is something that's shown to be yeah. beneficial. Right. I'm, I mean, I think that a pesca vegetarian diet for most people is a good basic approach to eating whole foods also mm -hmm. staying away from certainly ultra processed foods, but also minimal amounts of processed foods. Um, vitamin D is very important yep. in antiviral defenses. And, you know, if you live north of Atlanta in the U.S., the winter sun is too weak to generate much vitamin D. Right. So I think vitamin D supplementation is really worthwhile. The amount will depend on the person. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you get a lot of sun in the summer, your body's ability to bake, break down vitamin D goes up. Mm. So uh, I, a number of years ago, I had been doing a lot of mountain biking every summer. And, and I figured out, oh, I'm storing up all this vitamin D. Well, it lasts for about three weeks. So I checked my vitamin D level in December, in November. And it was really low right. because of all of the vitamin D that I had been building in my body just from sun exposure. I, I was breaking it down very rapidly as well. Yeah. So vitamin D is crucial. Now, the there are certain supplements that may be helpful at preventing the spread of infection. The one that has been tested in a controlled study was quercetin. Yeah. And I would say in general, a diet that is high in bio, bioflavonoids and other polyphenols 
is really important for two, for three reasons. One, it's general antioxidant effects. Two, um, it's immune modulating effects and it's anti-inflammatory effects in your body. And three, what it does to the gut microbiome, because um, polyphenols sort of act as curators for the microbes that are growing in your gut. I mean, what feeds them is what it, are the macronutrients you're taking in, you know, the fat, protein, and carbohydrates, and the fiber, of course, and fiber is important yeah. for them. But the polyphenols um, curate them. They sort of shape what's going to grow and what's not going to grow. Yeah. And so I think a high, a polyphenol rich diet is, should be a mainstay. What are some of your favorite of sources diet. of, what are some of your favorite sources of polyphenols? I know we have uh, olive oil is a very popular one. Sure. Um, uh, nuts and seeds and could be there and olives and olive oils, berries yep. are an excellent source. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and there are actually studies that have looked at the impact of, of eating these foods on health, um, on cognitive function. Um, and then um, tomatoes, um, you can, um, and herbs and spices, mm -hmm. herbs and, I mean, most of the, phys most of the great effect of herbs and spices is due to the polyphenols that are in them, teas green tea, oolong tea, uh, even black tea loaded with polyphenols. Even coffee has polyphenols right. in it. Yeah. And um, I mean, I don't want to den denigrate coffee by saying even coffee. Yes, coffee has polyphenols. Yeah. And drinking coffee protects against the development of diabetes, Parkinson's disease. Yeah, there, there are a number of health benefits to coffee. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, vitamin D uh, and, and quercetin are ones that I've been taking, you know, every day since since the pandemic started uh, myself, for sure. Um, any others that, that you really like? Any other supplements? Um, well, curcumin. Yeah. In yeah. terms of curcumin and resveratrol, yeah. I, um, I both found to be helpful. I didn't use a lot of resveratrol before the pandemic, frankly. I was a little skeptical of the whole anti-aging thing, but it has been very helpful. I've seen real benefits of resveratrol supplementation in my patients and, um, and in combating COVID-19. I mean, just last, um, yeah, it was over the winter. I had a patient, 86 years old, unvaccinated, multiple risk factors, got COVID for the first time since the onset of the pandemic. And there was a protocol of herbs that I gave her, which included resveratrol, curcumin, um, thymoquinone from black cumin seed, um, uh, bicalin from the Chinese herb, scutellaria bicalensis, which is used a lot in Chinese medicine, um, artemisia. Mm -hmm. And she amazingly breathed through, breathed, through, breathed through it within about 10 days. And when I asked her about it afterwards, she said, well, it was like a bad cold. Um, Amazing. So, yeah. So, of course, that's one case that doesn't prove a, a concept. But but it is definitely the case that that even people who are who have multiple risk factors for a bad outcome from COVID-19 can recover fully if they have some awareness of what they're of what they're doing. And I think the diet and nutrition really plays an important role there. Yeah, yeah. Would you say that lowering inflammation in the body is is critically important because kind of COVID will if you're already if your body's already inflamed, then you know, that's going to potentially make it much worse for you. And so, you know, the things that cause inflammation like alcohol and sugar and, you know, fried foods and things of that nature should I mean, I, I kind of feel like those should mostly be avoided anyway, right? Sure, they should be. Yeah, pre-existing inflammation, uh, including like very low-grade inflammation, plays a major role in the severity of COVID. Not whether you get it, but how severe it is once you get it. Yeah. And, um, and I think some of the mechanisms 
actually, I mean, they haven't gotten a lot of attention, but the, some of the mechanisms have been worked out. Um, the really severe manifestations of COVID are due to this massive inflammatory response that is generated by having the virus. And the mechanisms of that have been worked out. And uh, my interpretation of the data is, if you're somebody with a chronic low-grade inflammation in your body, because you have bad arteries, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, or are overweight, there is a shift in your immune system. And in particular cells in the immune system, um, these cells are called monocytes and macrophages. And they, are, they play a critical role in the immune response to COVID-19. Um, when they, when the way that inflammation affects them, and I'm talking about this chronic low-grade inflammation, is it increases the expression of certain molecules on their surface that actually allow the virus to enter them. Without these molecules, the virus might not even be able to get in. But with these molecules, it now gets in. And once it gets in, it um, provokes a huge explosion of inflammation, which is what we saw early, early in the pandemic. You know, people would go along, they'd seem to be, mm, it's not so bad for about five days, maybe a week. And then suddenly it was like the bottom would drop, up, drop out. And that was due to the impact of the chronic pre-existing low-grade inflammation on these white blood cells, opening up that gate. And, and it would be aggravated by the development of the antibodies, the natural antibodies. Um, yeah, it was, that, was, that was maybe the most frightening part of the pandemic when, when that was happening. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it didn't help that uh, alcohol sales went up and people gained the, <laughs> right. you know, gained the 20 pounds. Right, people were gaining weight and, and uh, you're right, that was definitely contributing yeah. to it. And, you know, and then they're eating all these comfort foods and stuck at home and you're, yeah. Right, right. Well, Dr. Gallant, I mean, this has been, this has been really eye opening. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of value. People I think are still afraid, you know, every time winter season, flu season comes around. Um, yeah. Any, any kind of final uh, words? And then also where can people find you, learn more from you, follow you? Well, I have a website, drgallant.com and I have an article on the landing page, a document called long COVID prevention and treatment. Uh, it was this was posted. I mean, I've been posting things since March of 2020, but this was posted earlier this year. Um, and I'll probably update it um, at the beginning of next year. Um, but it has a lot of information about the virus, the pandemic, um, specifically steps that I recommend for the prevention of long COVID if you do get infected and ways to understand and approach the problem of long COVID if you happen to have it or if someone else, someone in your family or someone you know has it. Um, it I mean, it's, it's laid out to try and help people um, understand, okay, this, this is my problem. Um, this is how I can begin to think about it um, and take steps on my own to improve. That's great. I mean, there are clearly some people who are going to need a physician who understands long COVID to help them. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are tens of millions of people being impacted right. by long COVID in the world right now. Um, but but that's up there. It's there, there are no strings attached. There are no charges. Uh, I just want to get the information out to as many people as I can. Oh, that's amazing. We, we, we thank you so much for all the knowledge and information that you're putting out there. Highly recommend people get that, drgallon.com. Uh, and we really appreciate we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge here today. I mean, this was uh, really eye-opening. I think people have some clear action steps. Uh, any final words? Um, yeah, I be very careful about all the fear mongering that's out there. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, think about this in a proactive way. There's something new in the world. 
And, um, and frankly, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether it came from a lab leak or from an animal. Um, because you were living with this. We're all living with this. It is not a hoax. It's really there. And it has changed the nature of our world. So, but think adaptively. Okay, we have to live with this. We have to adapt to it. Um, and be very wary of people who are trying to scare you, either one way or the other. Yeah. Um, and, and I've seen, you know, I've seen this kind of scaremongering on both sides. Oh, the vaccines are going to kill, kill you. No, they're not going to kill you. <laughs> uh, and, or this virus is going to destroy the human race. No, it's not going to do that. We can adapt to it. And you as an individual can take steps to protect yourself. Beautifully said, beautifully said. Go to drgallon.com, get the report there that he's offering for free. Uh, Dr. Gallon, thank you so much for everything you're doing. Uh, you are really a treasure for everyone who wants to better themselves and not just rely on medication after the fact, which as you mentioned earlier, can have potential other side effects. And, you know, it seems like once someone gets on one or two prescription medications, next thing you know, they're on three or four or more. And, and uh, you're trying to, you know, prevent that cycle and help people with, you know, really valuable information. So thank you so much for everything you're doing. And uh, yeah, hope we can do this again. Okay, I look forward to that. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, can you please leave us a rating or review and subscribe? I've realized that while we have actually increased our downloads a lot, we're actually getting a lot of downloads, which I'm really happy about. We actually have very few ratings. So, and I realized that I've never asked people really to rate much. So I'm asking you now, if you could please rate and review and subscribe. And if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to anyone that you think will get value out of this. Also, if you haven't checked out our line of products at buypeakperformance.com, you get 20% off your first order. That's www.buybuypeakperformance.com. Dot com. We have some incredible products, including our organic high altitude coffee. If you don't know this, coffee is one of the most heavily sprayed with pesticides out of any crop. So it's really important that you drink organic coffee. We've gone above and beyond to source what we believe is the highest quality and healthiest organic coffee in the world. We're also famous for our organic green superfood powder. You can get 20% off of that as well at buypeakperformance.com. We also have an organic vegan and paleo plant protein. See, most of the vegan proteins out there are using brown rice protein, which is really not a good source of protein, and it's also a grain. And if you're paleo, you know that grains tend to cause inflammation in some cases for some people. And so we wanted to make one that was paleo-friendly and vegan and organic. We made an amazing amino acid profile, so it's really one of the best plant proteins for muscle building. So you can check out Peak Performance Organic Plant Protein. You can find that on our website. Of course, all our products are on Amazon as well. So thanks again. And again, please, if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to someone who you feel can get value out of it. And please leave us a rating, review, and subscribe. Thank you.